FromSoft sparked a paradigm shift in modern game design following the development and release of their Souls games, including Bloodborne and Elden Ring. Games were allowed to be hard again. And not hard as in enemies deal double damage and take half damage or whatever. Souls games are difficult purely because of the knowledge gap spanning from the player's starting point and any individual encounter's skill floor. Every fight is at its absolute highest difficulty the first time you step into a room and can only get easier from there. FromSoft didn't invent the concept of a knowledge check, of course. Based on my scholarly research at my home computer, the first knowledge check in video games was knowing not to bother going up the clock tower in Castlevania 3, because Grant sucks. But in the interim 25 years between Dracula's Curse and Dark Souls 1, I didn't play Demon Souls. The blurred line between accessibility and simplicity began to erode, and capital G gamers were cursed with years of boring trite, with only a few bright spots developed by Capcom to placate the rabid action game freaks. But FromSoft's influence didn't really begin with Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1, did it? A lot of people didn't really get FromSoft's Souls design until Bloodborne came out, designed with the express purpose of teaching the player how to have fun while playing a Souls game. Don't block too much, dodge through attacks, and kill quickly. Bloodborne does an excellent job teaching the player these three key points, but because it was the first From Souls game to hit the mainstream, design aspects from earlier games often go ignored. Specifically, the excellent world design of Lordran and the decent world design of Dranglake. First off, I want to start with what I don't mean by world design. This is not a video about art style, environmental design, or graphical fidelity. When I say world design, I mean the way individual environments, areas, or levels connect to each other to form a cohesive whole. I'm interested in how FromSoft works to make a number of areas accessible for the player to carve a unique path through the game. Or conversely, how FromSoft gates off new zones to maintain late game surprises and a difficulty curve. Usually they use a very simple method of preventing player progress. Verticality. The maximum jump height, usually zero, and maximum fall distance, roughly 20 yards, are both static, with a few exceptions for flavor. Because of their advanced gaming knowledge, FromSoft can use these two numbers to design deliberate progression paths for players. This seems obvious, and it is, because I thought of it, but it's not always taken into account for open world design. Take for example a Bethesda game like Elder Scrolls where you can climb up a mountain with relative ease just by hugging a rocky surface. Or a game like Grand Theft Auto. Fall damage doesn't exist to keep the player out of places they shouldn't be, you can fucking fly. It only exists to ground the game in a sense of reality. You know, these games aren't Souls games. They have different design goals, so fuck them. The actual hard part of designing games vertically is communicating traversable areas to the player without feeling contrived. Or at least feeling contrived in a way that adds to the atmosphere instead of detracting from it. Overall, FromSoft does a good job with it. There's a lot of unexplained bullshit in these games, so dumb shit like these tombstones that stick out of cliff sides aren't gratuitous, they're intriguing lore developments. And I'm not just talking shit, this kind of plausible deniability is something I keep in mind in my real life. If I say enough stupid shit on purpose, then I'll get the benefit of the doubt when I say stupid shit on accident. Let me start with examples of how Dark Souls 1's Lordran fits together. I'm at Firelink Shrine right now, and I want to get to the Undead Parish bonfire, and I can't warp yet. The quickest, easiest way to do that is to take this elevator straight up to the church and walk right on through to the bonfire. But that elevator is a shortcut I unlocked by being in the parish in the first place. The intended initial route is up this cliffside and through the Undead Burg, over the Dragon Bridge, right through this gate if you're smooth with it, and around the church. But I don't want to deal with the Dragon Bridge, bro. I fucking hate the Dragon Bridge. Okay, I can go under Firelink, past New Londo and through the Valley of Drakes with the Master Key, head up through Darkroot Basin and past the Garden and come into the Parish from underneath. This one also puts you on the path to the Grasscrest Shield, but there's another dragon there. Okay, this one also needs the Master Key, but you can start through Undead Burg, under this tower, into the Basin and through the Garden again. The closest another Souls game gets to this level of complexity in a world design until Elden Ring is in Dark Souls 2 where you can get to the Lost Bastille from above which has unique loot, or from below, which doesn't. Bloodborne has a DS1 ladder that leads back up into Yarnum, but what the fuck do I care? I can just warp back there anytime I want. But it's not really a shortcut into Yarnum, it's a new path leading behind the clinic you woke up in. It isn't an example of the world fitting together in a way that's interesting or natural. It's some optional content that feeds into the secret ending. Dark Souls 3 doesn't even have that. There are a couple branches, but Lothric is just a series of hallways with no interconnectivity. But if you've played Dark Souls 1, you know I'm cheating a bit. I am cherry picking. Firelink Shrine is your home, so it has the greatest accessibility to other areas. Check out this simple map I made. The core cluster of areas near the center of Lordran, Firelink, Darkroot, New Londo, and the Valley, are all connected to each other in nearby areas in a way that feel natural and allow you to pick and choose what problems you want to deal with. But once you start getting outside of those areas, everything starts to turn more linear. Pardon my French. 
Light Town splits off into the Great Hollow, but to get to the end of Isolith, you're just in for a lot of walking down one long path, unless you're a big homo for women. Sens only leads to Anne Orlando, which branches out into the Painted World, an optional area, and the Duke's Archives, which only leads straight through the Crystal Caves to seat the Scalus. The worst offender is the Catacombs. You can only enter them from Firelink, and you can only follow them all the way to Nido. Your two options are further down or back up. This is roughly how Drang Lake is set up in Dark Souls 2 as well, except instead of a cluster of areas in the center of the world, it's just Majula, and the hallways come straight out of it. At least they can tackle the hallways in any order. As long as you have the right items from the other hallways. The way Dark Souls 1 limits warping is a great way of encouraging players developing familiarity with the world space, and leads to a lot of interesting relationships with the zones designed around it. When you descend through the depths into Blight Town, you are in Blight Town. It's a treacherous, stressful, oppressive environment, and you aren't getting out until you get to the bottom and climb back up. The frustration I had the first time I played still sits with me, even if I can run through Blight Town with relative ease. But this kind of pressure on players is just gone in later titles. If I'm having any trouble with the zone, I can just leave. Finding the plus 10 ember in the depths has a lot less emotional impact if I could just warp straight to Andre, turn in the ember, and clear the area with my newly reforged weapons. As Dark Souls 1 currently exists, the ember is one of the biggest incentives to fight through Blight Town, where large Titanite shards can be dropped by leeches. This is the kind of emotional connection players can only develop when they are forced to reckon with the environment they're in. Similar situations in Elden Ring can feel impactful. Taking away warps is a bigger change in player ability than not having them to begin with. But warp traps always spit the player out near another grace anyways, which really spoils the moment. If you sit at the bonfire before Pinwheel during your first playthrough of Dark Souls 1, it's gonna ruin your fucking day, and maybe your save file. Whether or not this is good design is not a question I'm interested in answering. Is it good design for an enemy to spend 30 minutes winding up an attack? I don't know. No, I'd rather deal with the bone wheels though. Which brings me to my real topic, Elden Ring and the Lands Between. The Lands Between don't look that impressive at a glance. You start in Limgrave and your choices are South, East, or Northwest. Heading South takes you to the Weeping Peninsula, a completely standalone area besides a sneak preview warp to Landell. East leads to Kaled, another standalone area but with a lot more red meat to it. Northwest has two different but parallel paths to Liurnia, which has two different but parallel paths to Altus, which splits into the areas surrounding either Mount Gelmir or Landell. And Landell splits for the last time into the mountaintops of the Giants and the Consecrated Snowfield. Again, at a glance, not that impressive. Kaled and the Weeping Peninsula are more like diversions from the critical path that leads to Liurnia. But this map only shows a surface level geological connections between areas. There are actually a few ways to get into Kaled. You can take the highway on the north side of Limgrave straight east, but you might stop on your way to talk to the Hunter of the Living Dead, and if you can kill his quarry for him, he'll give you a tip. Behind a church in Limgrave is a portal to the Bestial Sanctum, located at one of Caleb's furthest points. And if you so desire, you can use it as a backdoor into Caleb proper. Or you could find a trap chest that warps you to a mine in the middle of Caleb, stranding you until you can find a site of grace to rest at. This is probably the first chest many players are going to open, given it's right next to the start of the game. I know it was mine. There's even an entrance you can walk to by following Siofra River North, which has its own little area you can only access this way. Already we're seeing some complexity just between these two zones, albeit with a reliance on portals that comes to define Elden Ring's alternate progression paths. I can't be too bitter about warp points. The lands between are designed very specifically to be symbolically relevant to the story, and manufacturing new paths would probably be a big pain in the ass. But these warp points feel like a cheap way of surprising the player. The first couple can be mind-blowing, but the trick gets old quick. My favorite aspect of Lordran is how freeform it feels while maintaining continuity. Not just in the sense that many enemies stay dead, or levers stay pulled, or elevators don't move unless you move them, but also in the sense that you can walk from the top of Sen's Fortress to the deepest point in Lost Isolith without hitting a loading screen and giving up control of your character. There's probably a term for this, but fuck if I know what it is. Player contiguity? What's it called when the teleporters in Star Trek kill you temporarily because they erase you from existence? It's like that. You don't actually need to lose continuity in Elden Ring until you're outside of Langdale. Not because a load occurs when you enter, but because you need two great runes from the bearers accessible at the time, and only one of them can be accessed exclusively by walking. Even if you get Godrex without triggering a load, which is easy, Renala's second phase warps you to a new arena, and Radon and Rykard both live right behind warp gates. Once they've all been killed, you can explore almost the entire world southwest of the mountaintops without passing through a loading screen. Far, far more walkable space than Lordran below Anne Orlando. But because the lands between are so fucking big, and because there's no restriction on warping the graces outside of combat, you're essentially just not going to walk anywhere more than once. Your guns to warp. This is a pretend issue I made up, but the enforced pedestrianism of Dark Souls 1 really does a lot of work towards building Lordran's atmosphere. 
There's no real solution to this besides debigulating the world map and pissing off all the lowercase g gamers who want this $60 game to be bigger than the last $60 game they bought back when $60 was worth more. And he sure as fuck can't remove grace warps, at least not entirely, or else he'll get review bombed by casuals like Dragon's Dogma. I don't know, man. Lorden's just comfy. I like being there. The first time you play the environmental design might make you feel a bit cramped, you know, a little claustrophobic. But during replays, when you already know where to go and what to expect, it can be downright cozy. I live in the Midwestern United States, so I've never seen a landscape so elegantly walkable and wonderfully architectured. It reminds me a little of Ocarina of Time's Hyrule. You can follow the path to get to any area, but if you look for them, you can find some very useful shortcuts that can take you from Goron City to Lake Hylian just a minute or two. Not as an adult, though, only as a kid. Oh yeah, Elden Ring. Elden Ring has pretty good access to other areas even besides Kaelid, like the entrance into Altus. Besides the mine and elevator, there are actually two more ways to access it, one of which lets you bypass Altus entirely for story progression. First off, if you talk to trusty Patches in Liurnia, he'll point you under Raya Lucaria, where an abductor virgin is sitting. If you let it kill you with its crab attack, it'll take you to Mount Gelmir, underneath Volcano Manor. Now this is more fucking like it. It is another warp, but it's a really weird one, right at the intersection of nobody would think to try this and anybody could figure it out on accident. This one traps you again. To access Altus, you need to fight a pair of abductor virgins at the same time, or otherwise be stuck inside Mount Gelmir. There's a grace out in the open though, if you just want to leave. Finally, if you follow any of the various quest lines to activate Radon's festival without the need to access Altus, you can kill Radon, explore the city of Nakron, which is Death Unlocks, and head into the Deep Root Depths. In addition to unlocking Radon's fight, the festival also acts as a trigger for Fia's questline. By following your questline to the end, you can unlock another portal that takes you up to Lanedell, directly past what would have been the entrance. This alternate path is by far the most complicated to access and probably the least useful, since you still need two great runes. And by the time you can get into Lanedell this way, you're probably strong enough to just fight the Tree Sentinel out front anyways. For my money, it's gotta be the Abductor. That's pretty much it. There's only one way into every area after Lanedell. Mostly. There's a little more to the underground, there are a couple sneak peek warps, but I feel like I've gone on long enough. Overall, I think The Lands Between is a great first try at this type of world design. Elden Ring has so many places to go and ways to get around, and while there's plenty of room for improvement, FromSoft took all the right lessons from the attempt. And I know they did, because two years after The Lands Between, we got The Lands of Shadow, BD. A world space so wonderfully crafted, I literally can't put it into words. Mostly because I only played it the once, and I, I didn't take any notes, because I don't fucking owe you anything. In short, it's an incredible world with a lot of interesting connections, so many cool environments, they put Bowser's back door from Super Mario World in it, excellent use of vertically stacked environments and alternate progression paths that aren't just more fucking warps. It's good. It's good. I'm gonna go fucking play it now. Bye. Do I really want to live in Lordran? I mean, I wouldn't move there. But if I saw one of those posts, like, you are now in the world of the last game you played, how fucked are you, and it cursed me because I scrolled past it without interacting, and I woke up at Lordran, I probably wouldn't complain too much. Can't be that different from Toledo. Probably a similar amount of freaks. There's fewer drivers. Uh.